second book. Eh? Uh, this second book is called the Nidana Vaga, the book of causation. And this book contains ten Sangyutas. And the first is the Nidana Sangyutta. And the Nidana Sangyutta takes up almost half of the book. It's a very important topic eh, in early Buddhism. This Nidana, Nidana means cause or source or origin or condition. And uh, this uh, has the same meaning uh, as Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination. But instead of calling it uh, Paticca Samuppada Sangyutta, uh, which is uh, maybe too long, they call it the Nidana Sangyutta. Now there are many suttas uh, concerning this topic. Uh, most of it are in this uh, in this book that we are going to go into uh, this this particular chapter. But even in the Dika Nikaya, there's a, a longer sutta on this topic, Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination, and it is called the Mahanidana Sutta. I quote here from the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's introduction of this translation of the Sangyutta Nikaya. He says here, dependent origination is one of the central teachings of early Buddhism so vital to the teaching as a whole that the Buddha is quoted as saying in the Majjhima Nikaya, one who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma, and one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. So if you understand dependent origination, this chapter, the suttas in this chapter that we are going to go through, then you would have seen the Dhamma, and when you have seen the Dhamma, you will have attained stream entry. The ultimate purpose of the teaching on dependent origination is to expose the conditions that sustain the round of rebirths, samsara, so as to show what must be done to gain release from the round. This uh, topic uh, exposes the conditions uh, that sustain samsara. It really goes step by step uh, to unravel uh, the origin of suffering. Uh, and there are 12 conditions. Uh, uh, there are 12 conditions. So, the Pali formula uh, we often uh, chant uh, is uh, Avija Pachaya Sankara Sankara Pachaya Vinya Vinyanang, Vinyanang, Pachaya, Nam Marupang, Nam Marupang, Pachaya, Salaya, Tanang, like that, right up down to uh, birth, uh, Jati, then uh, all the other types of suffering. Uh, when you recite in this way, I see uh, ignorance gives rise to volition, and volition gives rise to consciousness, etc. So finally, ends up with. Uh, suffering. So this is called the origination forward sequence uh, in Pali's Anuloma. Then the other way of reciting it, uh, which we often do, uh, is Akavija uh, Yadveva Asisa Viraga Niroda Sankara Nirodo Sankara Niroda etc. So the other way uh, is the uh, cessation uh, or reverse sequence. Uh, that means we uh, ignorance ceases, then volition ceases, and because of ignorance ceasing, then volition ceases, and when volition ceases, then consciousness ceases, uh, in that order, and in the end, suffering ceases. Uh, at this point, uh, we are going into the deeper part of the Dhamma, unlike the first book. Uh, so, now, according to the traditional interpretation, uh, these 12 links of dependent origination uh, can be broken into three lifetimes, uh, the past, the present, and the future. And they say it is because of the past ignorance uh, and the past volition uh, that in the present life you have consciousness, 
They have Nama Rupa, they have six sense spaces, contact, feeling. These are the present effects. Uh. And then in the present life, uh, craving, clinging and existence uh, causes future birth. Uh, and future birth will come along with the aging and dying. Uh. So they break it up into three lifetimes. Uh. But I've written a book uh, on this subject, uh, Dependent Origination. I've ex I have explained that uh, there are certain suttas uh, that the Buddha has spoken uh, where the Buddha only considers two lifetimes, present and the future lifetime. And there are some uh, monks uh, also say uh, that these uh, 12 links, uh, you can refer to only one lifetime, uh, the present lifetime, uh, since the Buddha says that the Dhamma is Sanditiko, can be seen in this present lifetime. Uh, so all the 12 links, uh, you should be able also to see in this present lifetime. Uh, but uh, uh, without uh, explaining too much, uh, we can go straight into the suttas, uh, the Nidana Samyutta. Okay, now we go to the first sutta. That's what I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Nata Pindika Spa. There, the Blessed One addressed the monks as monks. Terrible sir, those monks replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, I will teach you dependent origination. Listen to that and attend closely, I will speak. Yes, Venerable Sir, those monks replied. The Blessed One said this, And what monks is dependent origination? With ignorance as condition, avijja, volition comes to be. Here, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi has translated as volitional formations. Volitional formations. And later, uh, you can see uh, the traditional interpretation uh, by the later monks uh, is that volitional formation, sankara here, uh, means karma. But uh, as I've said in my book, uh, Dependent Origination, I don't agree with it. Uh. Later you will see why. Uh. So here, instead of uh, translating it as volitional formations, uh, which whatever Bhikkhu Bodhi uses, uh, I would just say volition, sankara. In fact, uh, in the uh, five aggregates, uh, you also have sankara there. And in the five aggregates, uh, five aggregates means the five aggregates of a being, uh, body, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. Uh. So that is also basically body and mind. Uh, because we, can, we take ourselves to be this body and this mind. Uh. Inside the five aggregates, uh, you notice the fourth one is volition. And it's the same word, Sankara. There it's uh, mentioned to be volition. So here, you can also call it volition, same word, same meaning. So with ignorance as condition, uh, volition comes to be. With volition as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, name and form, Nama Rupa, sometimes it's translated as mentality, materiality. With name as, and form as condition, the six sense bases, salayatana. The six sense bases as condition, contact, asa. With contact as condition, feelings, vedana. With feeling as condition, craving, tanha. With craving as condition, clinging, upadana. With clinging, clinging as condition, existence, uh, bhava. Uh, here is translated as existence. La. But uh, I think I prefer the word being. But never mind, for the moment, uh, we continue as. With existence as condition, birth, jati. With birth as condition, aging and death. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair come to be. In, uh, this in Pali is jara, maranang, soka, parideva, dukkha, domana, supaya, sa. Such is the origin of this whole man of suffering. This monk is called dependent origination. I'll stop here for a moment. So here you see eh, this whole chain of 12 links, eh, dependent origination, is actually explaining eh, the dependent ori origination of suffering. 
because uh, to untangle this mess of suffering, uh, we have to understand where suffering comes from. Uh. So these twelve links uh, is trying to explain uh, where suffering comes from. You see the final uh, link uh, is called uh, aging and dying, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair. Yeah. This uh, is the whole mass of suffering, uh, aging and sickening and dying, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, sometimes called grief, grief and despair. Yeah. So all this is suffering. Uh, so later uh, you'll see uh, when they explain backwards, uh, this, the, the Buddha will ask, uh, where does this aging and dying, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair come from? comes from birth. Once you have birth, you, have, you must have aging and dying, etc. So it traces it the other way. So this is called dependent origination. And you always must remember when we say dependent origination, in the Buddha's teachings, it's always dependent, dependent origination of suffering. You continue. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance, Come cessation of volition. With the cessation of volition, cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness, cessation of name and form, namarupa, or mentality and materiality. With the cessation of mentality and materiality, cessation of the six sense basis. With the cessation of the six sense basis, cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact, cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling, cessation of craving, with the cessation of craving, cessation of clinging, with the cessation of clinging or attachment, uh, cessation of existence or being, with the cessation of being, cessation of birth, with the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. This is what the Blessed One said. Elated those monks delighted in the Blessed One's statement. Yeah. So here you see there are two uh, ways of, uh, of this uh, dependent origination. Uh, the first one is the uh, arising of suffering. And the other one, uh, when it talks about cessation of each one of the links, uh, is the cessation of suffering. Now we go into the second sutta, which explains each of these twelve conditions. At Savati, monks, I will teach you dependent origination, and I will analyze it for you. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. Yes, venerable sir, those monks reply. The Blessed One said this, And what monks is dependent origination? With ignorance as condition, volition comes to be. Revolution as conditioned consciousness, exactly as in the preceding sutta, such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. And what mounts is aging and death, the aging of the various beings in, in the various orders of beings, the growing old, brokenness of teeth, grayness of hair, wrinkling of skin, decline of vitality, degeneration of the faculties, this is called aging. Passing away of the various beings from the various orders of beings, their perishing, breakup, disappearance, mortality, death, completion of time, the breakup of the aggregates, the laying down of the carcass, this is called death. Thus, this aging and this death are together called aging and death. Let's stop here for a moment. So here we see yeah, uh, the explanation of aging and death uh, is like for human beings, how a person grows old and then the, uh, loses the teeth, the hair becomes white, the skin becomes wrinkled, decline of the vitality, etc. But this is not necessarily true all the time because this uh, dependent origination or suffering uh, applies not only to human beings but to applies to all beings. So in the case of heavenly beings, uh, you don't have uh, this type of aging, heavenly beings. Uh, 
they don't get white hair and broken teeth and wrinkled skin and all that lah. So this is a general general explanation. It's not it's not that it applies to every single being. Yes, also. Yeah. So and then what mounts is birth. The birth of the various beings into the various orders of beings. The being born, descend into the womb, production, the manifestation of the aggregates, the obtaining of the sense bases. This is called birth. Uh, this also, uh, stop here. This also refers to like human birth like, and maybe like animal birth, like, but not necessarily all beings like, because uh, there are some beings that don't enter the womb like, like here. This descend, descend, this descend into the womb. Uh, so, like uh, heavenly beings, uh, they are spontaneously born. Uh, what the Bible says, born of the spirit, uh, direct transformation. So, you must remember uh, sometimes this explanation uh, is uh, not always uh, applicable to all beings. And what monks is existence of being? There are these three kinds of existence of being. Sense, fear, existence of being. Form, sphere, existence of being. Formless, sphere, existence of being. This is called existence. Now this word, uh, existence, bhava, is one of the hardest uh, links uh, uh, to understand among these twelve links. So here, you see, uh, here it says there are three types of beings. Sense sphere being, form sphere being, and formless sphere being. Because the Buddha says every world system, we have three levels. The lowest level is called the sensual desire realm, where you have male and female, and all the beings are dominated by lust, sensual lust. And then slightly higher is the form realm. In the form realm, the beings have fine form. And they are reborn there because of having attained form jhana, rupa jhana. Uh, they have attained uh, one pointedness of mind. So when they are reborn in the form realm, uh, they, ex- they experience a uh, great bliss. And the bliss uh, comes from within them, inside them, uh, in the heart, in the mind, uh, because of the state of their mind. So they are not dominated by lust. So there is no male and female. They are all unisex. Uh, at Brahma. Brahma is only the lowest of the heavens. Uh, then the higher heavens you go, uh, the more bliss they experience. Uh. Then the third one is called the formless realm. This formless realm, uh, some books say uh, they are so called because they have no form, but it cannot be true uh, because in the suttas, Buddha says uh, you cannot have consciousness uh, uh, without it being accompanied by the other of the five aggregates. Uh, these five aggregates, uh, once you have consciousness, uh, you have a being uh, with consciousness, uh, that consciousness must reside in a body. Uh, okay, so you must have body. And when you have body and you have consciousness, uh, the others must be there, uh, namely feeling, perception, volition, uh, together with consciousness. Uh, so the body is the physical part, the mental part are these four things, uh, uh, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. Uh, so. It is called formless uh, because uh, it is so fine, uh, their the bodies are so fine uh, that other beings cannot see them. Even the form beings, uh, uh, those who have attained uh, Rupa, Jhana, they cannot see these uh, uh, beings uh, in the Arupa Jhana plane because Arupa Jhana is a much higher uh, Jhana, a meditative state. Uh, because the they, they, they bodies are so fine and so big. Uh, uh, the other other beings cannot see them, uh, that's why they are called formless. But they have a form, a very fine form. So here, existence uh, of being, uh, it says there are three types of being. Uh, very often, uh, people interpret that this word, uh, bhava, to mean existence, the world, uh, the world, the sense sphere world, the form sphere world, the formless sphere world. But uh, my understanding, uh, it's a bit different. Uh, my understanding is this this word, uh, bhava, should be being. Uh, being uh, meaning uh, a, a being uh, 
perceives that he exists. Lah. Because the suttas very often talks about the concept uh, uh, a being has uh, that I am, I exist. Yeah. Once you have this percep- perception uh, that I exist, yeah, uh, then uh, this will bring about uh, the previous factor of birth. Uh, once you, you feel uh, you exist in the world, uh, uh, the moment you come into the world, uh, that is the birth. Uh, so that's why existence, once there is existence, uh, there is birth. Uh, so this, this existence is not the material world existence. It's the existence of that self, the ego, that feeling, I am, I exist. Now, once you have that I am or I exist, then you have a being. Suddenly, I am a being. For example, a tree may have consciousness. A tree has a certain type of consciousness. But a tree has not, does not have the perception, I am or I exist. Right? Uh, so because a tree does not have the perception I am or I exist, huh? so it doesn't feel that, that it is born into the world, it doesn't feel that it suffers in the world. It's because we all putujanas, huh? all putujanas, uh, all beings huh? except the arahan, uh, because we have this uh, perception of I am. In fact, this I am huh? is the last, I think, uh, to be elimin- eliminated huh? before a person becomes liberated. Huh? Uh, the one of the five higher factors uh, is conceit, mana. Mana is a Pali word. The English translation is conceit. Uh, I think this conceit uh, means that feeling of I am or I exist. Uh, so this this word uh, bhava. Uh, henceforth, uh, I will try to remember to translate it as being, uh, not existence. And what mounts is uh, so. This, this is a very important word to. Understand that once you have being only, then only you feel you exist in the world, you feel that you are born into the world. And what monks is clinging? There are these four kinds of clinging. Clinging to sensual pleasures, clinging to views, clinging to rules and vows, clinging to a doctrine of self. This is called clinging. These are the four types of clinging. The first one, clinging to sensual pleasures. Kamu padana. Clinging is upadana or attachment. The second one, clinging to views. Did du padana. The third one is clinging to rules and vows. Sila batu padana. You see here, sila. Sila is rules. The other one is vata, is vows. Then clinging to the doctrine of a self. Atta Vadu Padana. Uh, so this is clinging. This one, there's uh, no difficulty in understanding. And what mounts is craving. There are these six classes of craving. Craving for forms, craving for sounds, craving for odors, craving for taste, craving for tactile objects, touch, uh, craving for mental phenomena, thoughts. Uh, this is called craving. So here, we crave for the six sense objects. And what mounts is feeling? There are these six classes of feeling. Feeling born of eye contact. Feeling born of ear contact. Feeling born of nose contact. Feeling born of tongue contact. Feeling born of body contact. Feeling born of mind contact. This is called feeling. Uh, so here feeling is like born of eye contact means you see something. Uh, and then a feeling arises. Ear contact means you hear a sound, a certain sound, and then a feeling arises, etc. And what mounts is contact. There are these six classes of contact. Eye contact, ear contact, nose contact, tongue contact, body contact, mind contact. In the suttas, it is mentioned, these six sense organs, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, any one of them are the condition that you have a sense organ and you have an object, then the consciousness will arise. And these three come together and when they contact, that is contact. And following contact, you have feeling, perception, volition and all that. So this is contact of the six senses. And what mounts are the six sense bases? The eye base, the ear base, the nose, tongue, body, mind. 
these are the six sense bases. And what mounts is name and form or mentality and materiality, feeling, perception, volition, contact, attention, this is called name. The four great elements and the form derived from the four great elements, this is called form. Thus this name and, and this form are together called name and form. This is name, Nama Rupa, name and form. Uh, another translation uh, is mentality and materiality. And sometimes people translate this uh, as body and mind. Nama Rupa, the Pali word here is Nama Rupa. It's not body and mind. Because uh, you see here, Nama is feeling, perception, volition, contact, attention. There is no consciousness here. And then form uh, is the four great elements and the form derived from the four great elements. So Nama Rupa is devoid of consciousness. So if there is no consciousness, uh, it cannot be mind, uh, body and mind. Uh. The body part is there, but not the mind part. Uh. Uh, so actually this Nama Rupa uh, is phenomena. Phenomena is the object of consciousness. Uh. The next, the next uh, link here is consciousness. And what monks is consciousness? There are these six classes of consciousness. Eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. This is called consciousness. So these uh, consciousness uh, and Nama Rupa, they always come together. According to the Buddha, uh, they are like... Uh, two sheaves of reed uh, standing, supporting each other, uh, leaning against each other. Uh, if one of them falls, the other one also falls. If one of them stands, the other also stands. They depend on each other. So, vijnana, consciousness, uh, and nama rupa, mentality, materiality, uh, always come together and cease together. They are one pair. They, you cannot separate them. Uh, they are like twins. Uh, you cannot separate them. So from here uh, you can understand, uh, since you cannot separate them, that Nama Rupa uh, is actually the object of consciousness. When you are conscious, uh, you have to be conscious of something. Uh, and that something that you are conscious of uh, is Nama Rupa. Okay? Uh, so in English it's called phenomena. Uh, phenomena, what we are conscious of. So we are, we are conscious of two types of things. One is we are conscious of mental activity. The other one is we are conscious of physical, uh, physical object and mental object. Uh. So the uh, mental object is nama. Uh. Here it says uh, feeling, perception, volition, contact, and attention. Uh. So we are conscious. This is the mental part uh, we are conscious of. Uh. And then the physical part uh, we are conscious of uh, is the four great elements uh, and the form derived from the four great elements. These four great elements uh, designate uh, the physical world. Uh. But the physical world, uh, since the physical world only exists in consciousness, uh, in a sense, uh, it's not real. You know. It's just a, a perception of consciousness. We perceive it. Uh, and because the physical world is a perception of consciousness, uh, that's why uh, it has four characteristics. One is the earth element. Here when you talk about the, the four great elements, uh, one is the earth element, means solidity. Uh. For example, I touch this table, it feels solid. Uh, it feels solid, but actually it's only a perception. Uh, if my mind is strong enough, uh, like a uh, arahan with psychic powers, uh, I can perceive this as soft. Uh, it doesn't have to be hard. right? Uh, this physical world uh, is just a perception. Right? And the other one is earth, uh, water. Water is, uh, uh, the characteristic of water uh, is that uh, it coheres together, it coheres together and forms a shape. So because we have water in our body, uh, you, we, we see ourselves in a certain shape. Uh. If we dehydrate our body, uh, take out all the water, the vapor from our body totally, uh, the whole body becomes like a powder, it will collapse like a powder. Uh. So that is the characteristic of water. Uh, it coheres the things together to give it a form, a uh, shape. Earth, water, fire. Fire is the heat element. Heat element. Suppose we, we, we touch something, we feel it hot or cold. Uh, uh, 
So that is a perception. Uh, and then the last one is uh, wind, earth, water, fire, wind. Wind uh, is a movement, characteristic of movement. So like in our body, uh, we have the wind element. So things move in our body, uh, the blood moves, uh, the air in our body moves, uh, the food in our in our stomach moves, all because of the wind element. Okay. So you see, uh, this uh, physical qualities, uh, earth, water, fire, wind, uh, they are only a perception, you know. So because of that, uh, the mind is very important. If your mind is pure, uh, your mind, you have a good heart, uh, the world, uh, all this perception, uh, all this perception in the world uh, is comfortable to you. Uh. For example, you don't feel too hot, you don't feel too cold. But if your karma is so bad, nah, your, 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 you have an evil mind, nah, you, you may perceive yourself in hell, nah, where it's terribly cold or it's terribly hot nah, with the flames of hell nah, burning you. Nah. All that is created by the mind. So the world actually is created by our mind. That's why our mind is so important. So uh, let's talking about uh, Nama Rupa. So Nama Rupa is mentality and materiality, yeah. Uh, what consciousness perceives. Uh, and after consciousness uh, is volition. And what mounts is volition. There are these three kinds of volition. Body volition, verbal volition, and mental volition. Uh, here the word is Sankara. Uh, so in Pali uh, is Kaya Sankara, Vachi Sankara, and Chitta Sankara. These three, uh, Kaya, Vachi, and Chitta Sankara, if you study the suttas, uh, uh, you will meet, uh, this is one set, uh, one set of three Sankaras, Kaya, Vachi, and Chitta Sankara. If you study the suttas, you will meet a second set, uh, called almost the same, Kaya Sankara, Vachi Sankara, and Mano Sankara. The last one is different, Mano Sankara. Uh, now these two sets, uh, uh, are used in different uh, different circumstances. In uh, Paticca Sambhupada, dependent origination, uh, you will find uh, that the Sankara is always these three, uh, Kaya, Vachi, and Chitta Sankara. But in some other suttas, uh, when they talk about karma, uh, karma, creating karma, then it is Kaya, Vachi, and Mano Sankara. So the problem uh, is with, with the later monks, uh, they seem to have confused the two. Uh, and uh, in the traditional interpretation uh, of this word Sankara here, it says volitional formations uh, or volition. Uh, they always associate volition uh, with karma, with creating karma. Uh, they, they say uh, because of ignorance in the past, uh, we created karma. So because of creating karma, uh, now we are reborn uh, with consciousness. Uh. Uh, but I feel that's a mistake. If you read my book, uh, Dependent Origination, uh, I see this word volition uh, has to do with the will to live. Uh. Because of ignorance, uh, we all beings uh, have a very strong will to live. Uh. The will to live, not to die. Uh. So because of the will to live, uh, the moment we die, our consciousness starts again. That is uh, Sankara. And what mounts is ignorance. Not knowing suffering, not knowing the origin of suffering, not knowing the cessation of suffering, not knowing the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called ignorance. Thus, monks, with ignorance as condition, volition comes to be. With volition as condition, consciousness. With consciousness as condition, nama rupa, mentality, materiality. With nama rupa as condition, the sixth sense basis come into existence. Uh, with six sense basis as condition, you have contact. With contact as condition, you have feeling. With feeling as condition, you have craving, then clinging, being, birth, aging, and death. Uh, uh, this is the origin of the old mass of suffering. Uh, and similarly, when ignorance ceases, uh, then volition ceases, and then consciousness ceases, and then mentality, materiality ceases one by one. Uh, now, I just uh, go through this again. Out of these 12 links, uh, you find uh, 
most of them uh, we can understand. Two uh, are stumbling blocks. Uh, one is Sankara, the other one is Bhava. Sankara uh, translate as uh, volition. Uh, here it says volitional formations. Uh. The other one is Bhava. Bhava here it says existence. Uh. I think it is being. Uh. Uh, so keep in mind uh, these two uh, these two uh, 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 sources of uh, conflict in, in, in interpretation. Uh. So now I go through this again, uh, how this uh, suffering comes about. So the first uh, condition uh, is ignorance, uh, not knowing the Four Noble Truths. When we don't understand the Four Noble Truths, uh, uh, we think the world is a nice place uh, to live. Uh. So because of ignorance, uh, we have volition. Volition is the will to live. Uh. Interpretation, uh, the will to live. Uh, uh, it's only the Arahans, uh, the, the, the Buddhas, uh, they have understood uh, the Four Noble Truths uh, and then they have no more will to live. Uh, they let go of the will to live. Uh, right? Whereas uh, all other beings, uh, you have a very strong will to live. Volition, Sankara. And this will to live uh, conditions consciousness. Uh, because of Sankara, the will to live, uh, you have consciousness. Consciousness continues. Uh, uh, and then when consciousness arises, uh, it must always come together with phenomena, mentality, materiality, the object of consciousness. Okay? So this is a pair. Uh. And once you have this consciousness, uh, then, and mentality, materiality, uh, then you must have a body. And this body has a sixth sense basis. Uh. Okay? Mm. And then the sixth sense basis, once you have a body uh, with six senses, uh, then there must be contact. Uh. Contact at the six sense basis. And then once there is contact, uh, either from seeing or hearing, etc., feeling arises. Okay? Uh, so this feeling, uh, if it is pleasant feeling, uh, it gives rise to craving. Uh, once you enjoy something, uh, uh, you, you crave for it. Uh. And once you crave for it, uh, and what are these things you crave for? You crave for forms, crave for sounds, crave for odor. Odors, grief for taste, grief for touch, grief for uh, mental phenomena. Mm. So once you have craving, uh, then you cling to it. Uh, okay? Cling to it. And when you cling to it, uh, when you enjoy something uh, and you cling to it, uh, you always have the feeling, I enjoy. I enjoy. That's why uh, uh, sensual pleasures uh, in the world uh, is it's a great obstacle uh, to liberation. Once we have, uh, we enjoy life, we have a good life, uh, we enjoy it, uh, then we don't want to let go because you, you, you have, the, you have the perception, uh, I am enjoying life, why should I let go of life? Uh, so only when you have suffering uh, that you want to uh, find a way out of samsara. Uh, once you have that clinging, uh, then you have that I exist, uh, that I am, uh, uh, that is the being, uh, bhava. So once you have the being, uh, uh, you have the feeling, I have come into the world, uh, that is birth. Uh, come into the world, birth. Uh, once you have birth, uh, then you have aging, sickening, dying, and all different types of suffering. Uh. So this is how suffering comes about. Uh. This part, uh, I have to take time to explain, uh, because this is the foundation. If you understand these 12 links fairly well, uh, then you will understand the subsequent suttas. Uh, otherwise, no point, huh? you go too fast, huh? you don't understand. Is there anything about these 12 links you want to ask? Okay, we go to the next sutta, 12.10. Monks, before my enlightenment, while I was still the Bodhisattva, not yet fully enlightened, it occurred to me, alas, this world has fallen into trouble in that it is born, ages and dies. It passes away and is reborn. Yet it does not understand the escape from this suffering aided by aging and death. When now will an escape be discerned from this suffering aided by aging and death? Then months it occurred to me, when what exists does aging and dying come to be? By what is aging and dying conditioned? Then months, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is birth, aging and death or dying comes to be. Aging and death has birth as, as its condition. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, the Buddha was trying to, uh, the Bodhisattva, uh, 
He was trying to analyze why is there suffering in this world. Then he realized it's because we are born into this world, huh? therefore we must suffer. Huh? If we are not born into this world, then there's no suffering. Huh? So the the cause huh, of aging and dying, huh, that means suffering, huh, is birth. Huh. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does birth come to be? By what is birth conditioned? Then monks, to careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is being, birth comes to be. Birth as existence, as being, as its condition. Uh, then uh, stop here for a moment. Huh. So here the Buddha is thinking, uh, why is there birth? Uh, then he realized, uh, there is birth uh, because there is this perception, I exist, uh, I am. Uh, when, you, when you have that feeling, uh, I exist in this world, uh, uh, then you perceive that you are born into this world. Uh, right? Uh, then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, uh, or when what this word Baba can be exist. Does exist, does being come to be? When what exists, does being come to be? By what is being conditioned or existence conditioned? Then monks, by careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is clinging, being comes to be. Clinging, um, being has clinging as its condition. Uh, uh, stop your moment now. Uh. As I explained just now, uh, uh, once you enjoy life, uh, you cling to it, uh, then you have the perception uh, that I enjoy life, I exist. Uh, so that's why uh, the being comes into it. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does clinging come to be? By what is clinging conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom, and there is craving. Clinging comes to be. Clinging has craving as its condition. Then monks, it occurred, it occurred to me, when what exists, does craving come to be? By what is craving conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom, and there is feeling. Craving comes to be. Craving has feeling for its condition. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here, huh, when there is pleasant feeling, huh, because feeling there, there is pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, and neutral feeling. So when you experience pleasure, when you have a, a pleasurable feeling, then you crave, the craving arises. Just like a small kid never tasted ice cream, you give him ice cream, when he tastes it, the, 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 the pleasurable feeling makes him crave for it. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does feeling come to be? By what is feeling conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. And there is contact, feeling comes to be. Feeling has contact as its condition. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does contact come to be? By what is contact conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. And there are the, when there are the six sense bases, contact comes to be. Contact has the six sense bases as its condition. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists do the six sense bases come to be? By what are the six sense bases conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is mentality, materiality, the six sense bases come to be. The six sense bases have mentality, materiality as their condition. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does mentality and materiality come to be? By what is mentality and materiality conditioned? Then monks, to careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is consciousness, uh, mentality and materiality comes to be. Mentality and materiality has consciousness as, as its condition. Stop here for a moment. These two, Nama uh, Rupa and Vinyana, uh, mentality, materiality uh, and consciousness, uh, you must always consider them as a pair uh, because they arise together and cease together. Hmm? Hmm. These, because they, 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 they are twins, uh, you have to see uh, that when consciousness and mentality, materiality, materiality exists, uh, uh, that means 
there is consciousness, uh, then the being comes into uh, come uh, exists. Uh, then you, the being must have the six senses. Uh, it's through the six senses uh, that he perceives the world. Uh, so from there, uh, when we have the six senses, uh, then contact at uh, the six senses occurs, uh, which gives rise to feeling, etc. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does consciousness come to be? By what is consciousness conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is volition, consciousness comes to be. Consciousness has volition as its condition. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does volition come to be? By what is volition conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. And there is ignorance, volition comes to be. Volition has ignorance as its condition. Thus, with ignorance as condition, volition comes to be. With volition as condition, consciousness, etc., etc. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Now, origination, origination, thus monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. Stop here for a moment. So here, uh, the Buddha's experience uh, was that uh, when he was considering the, this uh, dependent origination, uh, he considered and he understood, uh, and the mind uh, became bright uh, because he, he, he basically his mind is already bright. Uh, but when he applied his uh, clear mind uh, to contemplating uh, dependent origination, uh, then light arose, uh, just like uh, on the night of enlightenment. Uh, when the Buddha was practicing hard to become enlightened, then uh, when he attained enlightenment, uh, the Buddha said, uh, light arose, uh, knowledge arose. Uh, so it's the same here. So the rest of the sutta is uh, the, the reverse. Uh, then monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, does aging and death not come to be? With the cessation of what does the cessation of aging and death, that means suffering, uh, come about? Then monks, to careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is no birth, aging and death, that means suffering, uh, does not come to be. With the cessation of birth comes cessation of aging and death. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, does birth not come to be? By the cessation of what does the cessation of birth come about? Then monks, to careful attention, etc., then you realize, uh, when there is no being, birth does not come to be. The cessation of being comes cessation of birth, etc., etc. So I won't repeat the, the, the rest, huh? the, the links, huh? the travel links are quite the same. So here you see, huh? sometimes, like in this case, huh? the Buddha comes to understanding huh? this true logic, huh? this thinking clearly. Huh? Uh, why is there suffering? When you contemplate the reason for suffering, and then you realize uh, it's because this world is a world of suffering. Uh. So it's because we are born into this world uh, that we suffer. If we are not born into this world, then we don't suffer. Uh. And why are we born into this world? Uh, because we have that feeling, uh, I exist, uh, I am. Uh, once you have that I, uh, then you, have, you, 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 you see yourself in the world. Uh, then why is there bhava and being? Uh, because of clinging. We cling. That's why uh, at the moment of death, uh, we refuse to die. We still cling to life. Uh, so that strength, uh, that, that willpower, uh, brings us uh, into the next birth. Uh, okay, since these suttas are quite tough going, uh, I won't go fast. Uh, I'll stop here for the moment. And we can discuss. This type of suttas uh, are not easy to understand, but if you take the trouble to understand, uh, the Buddha says, uh, he who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. Uh, so when you see the Dhamma, uh, the Buddha says, uh, you have attained the Dhamma Chakku, vision of the Dhamma, that makes you a stream enterer. That's why it's important to go through these suttas uh, and try to digest it, uh, try to understand. To be easier, to understand uh, if you have a clear mind, and that clear mind comes from meditation. Any question? Mentality and materiality. Now, there's name and form. Uh, 
actually uh, it's not necessary that this condition is that it can be the other way also. Uh, it's just uh, convenience lah because uh, in some other sutta it's explained that they come together. Just like some suttas, uh, they explain uh, because of ignorance, uh, you have asava. Asava is a mental uncontrolled mental outflows. Lah. And then some suttas, uh, they have the reverse. Because of asava, you have ignorance. Uh, so you, you, you must see more suttas uh, to understand. Uh, cannot be what we call see pan. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned uh, the two arise together and cease together. They come in a pair, you cannot separate them. Because when you have consciousness, uh, you must have an object of consciousness. As far as these six consciousnesses are concerned, uh, they must always have an object. It's only the state of uh, Parinibbana, uh, like the Buddha says, uh, that ultimate state uh, that is that a type of consciousness without object. Yeah, sometimes some people have a uh, coming obstacle. Time is not right. Huh? That means uh, they are not spiritually mature enough. When the person is spiritually mature, uh, then your mind is such uh, that you are ready to let go. There are some people, they come into the Dhamma, they still got a lot of clinging. So they cannot let go a lot of their bad habits, their bad character and all that. So, mm. Yeah, yeah, that's always... Uh, see our mind uh, and admit our faults. Uh, there are some people uh, who always refuse to see their faults. Uh, and so even you try to tell them, uh, they get angry. Yeah. Then uh, you have to change. Uh, if you see your fault, you have to change. <laughs> ah, yeah. Yes, that's why the Buddha says uh, the spiritual path uh, is a very gradual path. Just like the ocean uh, uh, slopes and uh, becomes deeper uh, very gradually, uh, does not become deep suddenly. Uh. So in the same way, the spiritual path, uh, we progress uh, step by step. Uh, it takes many years to progress. Uh. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, because of uh, worries, because of um, uh, obligations, and all that. Uh. That's why uh, the Buddha uh, um, encouraged uh, people who want to practice the spiritual path uh, to renounce the home life. Uh. If you have a business to worry about, a family to worry about, uh, you don't have to do anything, uh, just pop up, keep popping up. <laughs> Yeah. 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 thing is, um, because you always have all these worries, Yeah. Uh, in fact, like doing business, Yeah. Uh, is, 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 is very bad for the mental cultivation, uh, for the spiritual part, uh. People maybe who makan gaji, uh, they work for somebody else, uh, they don't have so much worries. Ma. If you are the boss, uh, you have so much worries. How to let go? How to how to how to stop worrying? Yeah. Buddha said uh, the holy path goes this way, spiritual path goes this way. Very hard to combine. Sincerity is the most important. Whether you are sincere to walk that path or not. A lot of people are not, they, they, they say only that they want to walk the spiritual path, but they cannot let go, is it? If they cannot let go, then they cannot, they have to let go.
generally yeah, people who have a good life lah, you have a lot of money and all that lah, generally it's more difficult to let go lah. But in the suttas, the Buddha, there's one sutta, I think in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Buddha says, huh, that is not always the case. The Buddha quoted a case of a poor man, huh, uh, and his wife is uh, ugly looking and old, and uh, he's got empty house, got nothing, huh, old people money and all that. Huh. Still, huh, you ask him to let go also, he cannot let go. <laughs> I see, not necessarily that he's poor, huh? he can let go. On the other hand, huh? you may have uh, somebody from a very rich family like Siddhartha Gautama. A wife is young and beautiful and the family is rich. Huh? Despite all, all that, also he let go and go off. Uh, so, it's the, the, the time, huh? every one of us, huh, we have a time. Uh, whether your time has come or not. When your time has come, huh, nobody can hold you back. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. If you let go too fast, uh, then you will also go back. Uh, yeah. No. Oh. So you see, the light of the Dhamma is not a physical light. No. It's an understanding of the Dhamma. Oh, you have to... You have to go to more suttas and then meditate more, and then slowly, slowly, yeah, over the years, yeah, you will slowly, slowly digest. Yeah. You cannot rush one. Takes time. Also, you must know why we want to know this sequence. Yeah. Because we want to break this chain. So you want to break this chain, you also have to understand now where you can break. See, there are 12, 12 links there. Huh? You cannot simply break at any point one. The only one place only you can break. Ah, that one later you have to understand. Now you haven't studied enough sutta, you don't know that. Huh? Not so easy. Not so easy. Because I know of one teacher of this particular meditation. Huh? He was practicing and teaching for many years. And finally, he realized huh, it doesn't work. Just to see it, huh, it's not enough. Just like the mindfulness. Huh? A lot of people think, I huh, practice mindfulness. Huh? See your defilements, huh? then you can get rid of it. No, because the defilements huh, are deep-rooted. Deep-rooted. You can see it, but you cannot pull out the roots. Uh, the only way to pull out the roots uh, is to go down to the roots. And how to go down to the roots? Go deep into your mind. Uh. Uh, that's why samadhi is so important. When we cultivate samadhi, uh, the deeper samadhi you get, uh, the deeper you go into your mind. Uh, so when you go deeper into your mind, uh, then only you are able to pull it up. Just mindfulness is not enough. Just like telling somebody, oh, uh, it's somebody is a drunkard. Uh. You tell him, drinking is no good. Uh, you're harming yourself, you're harming your family, uh, you're not working, your family is suffering and all that. He knows, he knows, but he cannot let go. He cannot, he cannot throw away the bottle. Uh, this is a crutch. Lah. It's been, uh, he's been using that crutch for so many years, you ask him to throw away, he cannot. But if his mind is strong enough, it's different. His mind is strong enough. Huh? Then he realizes it's no good for him. Uh, he just chuck it off. Whether your mind is strong enough or not. There are some people uh, where the mind is so strong uh, that uh, they can do it. Uh. There's one, I think in the Theragatha or somewhere, uh, mentioned about one layman. Uh, 
he is a very rich man uh, and every day uh, he enjoys uh, seeing his slaves dancing and singing for him and he'll drink liquor until he gets drunk and see all the slaves dancing and drinking for him. But because this person uh, has what we call good roots, uh, he former life he was an ascetic uh, and the Buddha knew. See? So the Buddha came to, to him. Uh, so the Buddha just walked past his house. And he saw the Buddha, something from the past uh, struck him, you know. Something from the past struck him. And when he looked at the Buddha, his mind uh, became one point. When he looked at the Buddha, he focused his mind uh, on the Buddha. His mind became one po pointed, uh, one pointed. Uh, all his drunkenness he shook up. <laughs> then he went to see the Buddha and uh, he respected the Buddha, everything, and then became a follower of the Buddha. So you see, uh, if you have that strength of mind, that's why samadhi is so important. If your mind is strong, uh, when you focus it on something, uh, it's like a laser beam. Uh, so that's why when we hear the Dhamma, for somebody uh, who has a good samadhi, uh, when he hears the Dhamma, he just has to concentrate on it. Uh, he will understand. As a person with a groggy mind, uh, blur blur mind, uh, how many times he hears the sutta also, it doesn't penetrate, nah. he's like a drunk. <laughs> Stop and talk. You know, people don't understand the use of samadhi. Yeah? You have an internal voice ah, talking to you. That probably is, the mind is not concentrated enough, ah, so you still have this... Uh, talking uh, in the mind. Just, just focus your attention on your object. Uh. Don't think about it. Just like sometimes when you are meditating, uh, if your mind is not concentrated enough, uh, you think, ah, yeah, today very hot. Uh. <laughs> ah, yeah, the sand fly biting my ear. Uh. Ah, yeah, my leg is painful. Uh. All these uh, uh, can be said to be stray thoughts. Uh. But if your mind is focused on your object, uh, then even the sand fly bite you also you don't notice. Even your leg pain also you don't notice. All these things you don't notice. Oh, so I do to you. Huh? <laughs> That's why the Dhamma is so powerful. Huh? Like the bandit Angulimala. So many people tried to catch him, so many people tried to kill him, nobody could fight with him. But the Buddha, just with words of Dhamma, changed him completely. Not much, you have to understand exactly each link one by one. That's why we have to combine our study of the suttas with constant meditation. Meditation is to sharpen our mind. Uh, then uh, we study the suttas uh, to give us that wisdom. No, uh, no problem. Uh. Mm. If they want to recite, uh, I, I think it would be better if they recite in their local language. So <laughs> at least they can understand. Yeah. You have the interest in the Dhamma, so when you listen to it, uh, it appeals to you. Uh, but some people uh, who don't have the affinity for the Dhamma, they cannot, they cannot listen. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's why you see people like Devadatta, with the Buddha as a teacher also, huh, he goes to hell. And in spite of all his uh, jhanas and psychic power and all that also, he goes to hell. So that's why you have to be very careful. The only way not to be reborn huh, is to have dispassion. You totally tired of the world. 
So if a person is bedridden and is sick of the body, yeah, he may be sick of his body, but he still uh, cannot let go the grandson, the granddaughter, the son, the daughter, and all that. So the attachment, uh, there are many types of attachment, is it? Uh, so it's not just body only. Uh, so uh, if you have any kind of attachment at all, uh, you still cannot, cannot uh, get out of samsara. For example, there are some people, uh, maybe their business goes bankrupt. And then they go and commit suicide, they don't want to live anymore. But they still come back. Because even though they don't want to live, uh, actually uh, inside, uh, they still want. That's why many years ago, uh, many years ago, uh, I saw in the newspaper about one, one young man in Singapore. He jumped from a high building. The moment he jumped, uh, he realized he, he, he doesn't want to die. He shouted, I forgot what he shouted, uh, I want to live or something like that. Too late, uh, he realized. I also know somebody who, out of uh, uh, depression, uh, he tried to commit suicide many times, uh, he did not succeed. Finally, one day, uh, he jumped into the mining pond. Then when he was drowning, uh, he panicked and swam out of the pond. <laughs> I see. Uh, you think you want to die, but when you actually you are about to die, yeah, then you realize you don't want to die. The clinging inside there, the ego, you haven't let go of that ego. You, as long as you have the ego, huh, you want to live, huh, you want to protect the life. Huh. The instinct to survive huh, is a very strong instinct. Will to live. Huh. In fact, uh, later I'll explain uh, that's the cause of this round. This uh, twelve links uh, is because of this will to live. Ah, oh, yeah. This uh, craving for existence uh, and craving for non-existence, uh, they bring us to rebirth. Uh. The craving for existence we understand uh, because we want to live. But the craving for non-existence, uh, there are two types. Uh. One is <clears throat> a person who wants to commit suicide because of seeing Dukkha. He doesn't want to live anymore. Uh. So... He will try many times uh, until he succeeds, uh, until he dies. Uh. But that person, uh, his heart is burning. Uh, uh, he's very agitated. So when he dies, he cannot enter Nibbana. Nibbana is a cool state. Uh, you have to be totally cool. Uh, let go of everything, then only you can enter Nibbana. So a person who commits suicide, uh, he will definitely be reborn, even though uh, he has that uh, desire not to be reborn. The other one is uh, ascetic. Uh, ascetic, uh, he is feeling so much dukkha uh, that he wants to get to get liberated uh, from uh, rebirth. So he tries very hard, uh, just like our our Buddha. Before our Buddha was enlightened, uh, he tried all ways, uh, all kinds of ascetic practice. Uh, 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 he sees uh, all the different types of ascetics uh, practicing. Uh, he just uh, uh, follow them. So all these uh, practice uh, ascetic practices, uh, he does it uh, with the with the extreme desire uh, for liberation. So this uh, extreme desire, uh, because his mind is agitated, uh, is so strong, uh, he cannot get. Uh, liberation. That's why the first sutta I read uh, in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the Buddha said, uh, uh, when he strove too hard, he got whirled around. When he stood still, uh, he sank. So without striving too hard and without standing still, uh, he crossed the flood. So the middle path, uh, middle path we, we put in the effort uh, because uh, it's necessary, uh, but the desire to become liberated uh, must not be too strong. The desire become liberated is too strong, your mind is agitated, you're not playing it, not playing it cool, so you cannot attain a cool state. Okay, can we end here?